My name is Thomas Primak in English, Thomas Primak in Ukrainian. I'm a third generation Ukrainian Canadian who was interested in his heritage and did a PhD in Ukrainian history. Uh, and oh, by the way, I'm also a research associate with the Chair of Ukrainian Studies in the Departments of History and Political Science at the University of Toronto. I've uh, taught at several different Canadian universities and published four books and altogether about 150 publications in the general field of Ukrainian studies, both Ukrainian history in Europe and Ukrainian studies here in Canada as well. So this particular book, Gathering a Heritage, uh, fits into the second category, um, the history of the Ukrainians in Canada, but also touches very much upon uh, Ukrainian history in Europe as well sort of bridges the two, because uh, more than half of the book is about Ukrainian historians and scholars uh, who started off in Europe and, and later went into emigration, came to Canada, and continued their work, their work here in Canada, and then had an influence on Canadian scholars as well. So that makes up about one-third of the book. Another part of the book deals with Ukrainian immigration to Canada. The first uh, two or three chapters deals with that. And um, I deal primarily with the uh, first period, the first two periods of Ukrainian-Canadian history. That is the pioneer period before the First World War, which lasted from the 1890s until 1914 when the war broke out. Then, of course, immigration stopped during the First World War. There was virtually none until the 1920s. In the 1920s, it picked up quite a bit especially after the so-called railways agreement between uh, the Dominion of Canada and the Republic of Poland. And between the wars, a great number of people came to Canada from, the, Ukraine, from uh, the Republic of Poland. But they came from the Ukrainian part of the Republic of Poland, Old Galicia, same as the pioneer uh, immigration. And they mostly came between the years 1925 and 1930. So I also deal with that set Second period. So those two periods are the main periods of immigration that I deal with, because my own family uh, originates with those two periods, the pioneer period before the First World War and the interwar period. Uh, thereafter, I go into the Ukrainian emigres in Canada and Ukrainian life in Canada. And as I said, there's quite a bit on in the book about that. And then the final part of the book uh, deals with... Um, library studies, Ukrainian libraries in Canada, what they contain, how they got that material, how it's organized, and whereabouts in Canada are the most important collections of Ukrainica and uh, Ukrainica Canadiana. In general, Ukrainian studies is, is, is not a very well-developed field. And when I entered the field, it, it was virtually undeveloped. Um, during the Cold War, um, when I entered the field, there were tremendous political uh, pressures not to do Ukrainian history. Um, this was because of the general political context of the time. And even here in North America, I think it was very difficult to do Ukrainian history. Say if you were of Ukrainian background and you wanted to find out something about it. It wasn't easy. There were only two major centers of Ukrainian studies in, in North America, um, on a university level, really, that did Ukrainian history. Those were the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Boston area, where Omelian Pritsak set up a number of chairs of Ukrainian studies, three actually, and uh, the Ukrainian uh, Research Institute itself, the Harvard Institute. The second was the university at the University of Alberta, where the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies was founded. About the same time, more or less, the, uh, the uh, early 1970s. And um, there, um, Manoli Lupo was the first director and uh, helped organize the institution. And a number of other important uh, people were there, especially the historian Ivan Lysiak-Rudnitsky, who was a very, very prominent Ukrainian historian, a deep thinker, a man who did the history of Ukrainian political thought and modern Ukrainian history. This was very good in a way because it complemented the Harvard Institute, which did older Ukrainian history, medieval times. And uh, Omelian Pritsak, who set up that institute, was primarily a medievalist. So there was some good balance there. Uh, outside of those two research institutes, one at Harvard and one in Alberta, 
There were a few other places where Ukrainian history was approached. In particular, in the University of Manitoba, where a very prominent historian named Oli Garris uh, was situated. He taught, he was actually a pioneer in the field um, and uh, edited the famous textbook by Dmitry Doroshenko, very well known uh, Ukrainian historian in Ukraine, excellent writer, very attractive writer, wrote very smoothly and fluidly, and, and people liked reading him. Well, this was translated into English in the 1930s and published in Edmonton in 1939. But it was long out of print. And he re-edited it and uh, brought it up to date. And uh, it was reprinted in 1975 and became the first real textbook for English language students in North America. So there were a few places, but the real uh, push for Ukrainian history, at least, in, in higher education was at Harvard and at the University of Alberta. In my generation, um, people of the older immigration, people of my parents' uh, generation anyhow, uh, were very often discouraged from encouraging their background. In the 1930s, during the Depression, there was still a certain amount of discrimination in Canada, and uh, they had to grow up with that, and it was difficult for them. And so they didn't, they didn't always show off their Ukrainian heritage. And my generation, the younger generation, very, very many of us didn't learn very much about it. So unless you went to a Ukrainian church or something like that, uh, you lost a lot of it. The first essay uh, deals with, um, uh, well, how should I say, the reflection of the emigration experience in the Slavonic literatures, of which Ukrainian was one. There were a number of very prominent writers who wrote about emigration. For example, among the Poles, there was Henryk Sienkiewicz, who wrote about the Polish immigration. And for Ukrainians, there was Ivan Franko, who wrote about uh, the Ukrainian immigration. So the first essay deals with that sort of thing. The second deals with immigration, in particular from the Russian Empire to the Americas. And uh, in that essay, I describe uh, the, the research that was going on in the Soviet Union just before it collapsed, when they were just getting underway. And then there's um, uh, a third um, essay in that first section on Ivan Franco. Ivan Franco himself was interested in the emigration. He considered himself emigrating from Galicia, from old Halichina, to Canada. And he wrote to someone, I forget exactly who offhand, but he wrote to one of his colleagues, I think it was Drahomanov, Mikhail Drahomanov, saying that he'll come to Canada, he'll go to Canada if he has an opportunity. And that's probably because the political situation in, in Halichina was not very good for him at that particular time. So um, he, did not, he didn't come to Canada himself, but he, he wrote about Canada and he wrote about immigration to the United States. He contributed to newspapers in the United States and Canada. And he wrote this very famous poem called Do Brasili, To Brazil, about Ukrainian or Ruthenian, as they were called at the time, uh, immigrants who were emigrating to Brazil. And when he got involved in the emigration, together with a gentleman by the name of Olescu, Osip Olescu, who organized the Ukrainian immigration to Canada in particular, Franco tried to redirect the immigration from Brazil, which he thought was not a very good target country, to Canada, which he thought was a thousand times better. So those are, that's the first section of the book. Now, the second section deals with a number of historians, uh, primarily, and, and other scholars, uh, who um, were, as I said earlier, uh, emigres, who came from Europe and worked in North America or somehow got involved in Ukrainian studies already being in North America. The most famous of these was uh, Dmitry Doroshenko. Doroshenko was a really very important uh, historian indeed. He was a conservative politically, unlike Rushevsky, who was left-wing and a socialist. But he had a very uh, generous attitude towards his colleagues. He tried not to get into fight with pe fights with people he tried not to criticize his colleagues unnecessarily, and he managed to get along with a wide, wide circle of people. So, and he also had a very gentlemanly manner. So this winning personality really helped him a lot in his scholarly work. And in the 1930s, the Canadians invited him to come to Canada and give a lecture tour of Canada. He did so, and it was enormously successful. He visited all the major Canadian cities that had a Ukrainian population from Toronto all the way to Edmonton and back again. 
And uh, they were a success. This uh, lecture tour was a success. So successful, in fact, that the Canadians invited him back a second time, and he returned the second year. He was going to come a third time as well. They wanted him again, but the war broke out in 1939, and it couldn't happen. So uh, after the war, uh, when so many of these Ukrainians in Europe uh, were refugees in Germany, Ukrainian intellectuals, re refugees in Germany, a lot of them were afraid that uh, uh, the Soviets would march eventually further west, there would be another war, and they would wind up in Soviet hands and punish severely. So they wanted to get out of Europe and get as far away from the Soviet Union as they could. And uh, by 1947, the Western countries started to open up to them. Doroshenko was one of the first, and he came to Canada. He came in particular to the city of Winnipeg in Western Canada, which had a very large Ukrainian population at the time. Today it consists of approximately 15% of the population of Winnipeg, many, many thousands of people. At that time, I think it was probably slightly smaller, but still it was the largest Ukrainian urban community in the country. And there he, he based himself at the uh, St. Andrew's College, which was an Orthodox college, later affiliated with the University of Manitoba, and he continued to write. He wrote his memoirs there and a number of other important books. But the prairie qu climate was actually very hard on him, and uh, eventually he got very, very sick and uh, somewhat depressed and decided to return to Europe. He did return to Europe where he died shortly later. So the, a good part of the, the second section is about him in particular, and there are other essays on his colleagues and friends. In particular, I should mention uh, George Simpson of the University of Saskatchewan, who was uh, very favorable to the Ukrainians, set up the first Slavic studies in Canada at his university, and um, befriended uh, most of the Ukrainians that he met, especially Ukrainian scholars. So Simpson was very, very important in those early days before multiculturalism. I believe that uh, most of the essays in this particular book are very original. Um, there was virtually nothing about the biography of uh, Doroshenko when I started. Uh, now the footwork is done and somebody can put together a real scholarly biography. Um, I have worked both on Doroshenko's career in Europe and here in Canada. That's all done. Uh, the same thing with some of the other essays. So I think there is a certain uh, uh, amount of pioneering in this particular work, yes. There is one particular essay which I think stands out in the book. And that's the essay right in the middle um, dealing with uh, the Canadian, the French-Canadian writer, writer Gabrielle Bois. Uh, she's a very prominent writer here in Canada, one of Canada's greatest writers, actually. And there's a chapter of her biography uh, that deals with his, her fellow citizens, the Ukrainian Canadians. In 1938, she went to Europe, a young woman and an actress, and she went to study uh, acting in, in in London. And there she met a young Ukrainian-Canadian from Alberta by the name of Stephen Davidovich. Uh, they fell in love. They fell in love instantly. It was a very passionate affair. But one day he disappeared, and she had no idea why he disappeared. Um, it turns out that uh, when he came back about a month later and showed up her, at her door, um, they had a long conversation. They went for a walk, sat down on a park bench, and he poured his heart out to her. He couldn't tell her everything because, he said, the more he told her, the more it would put her life in danger. He was working underground for the Ukrainian Organization of Nationalists. The own it is sometimes called, and uh, he could he that was the reason why he had disappeared. He was called away suddenly on work for this organization, and uh, what he didn't tell her, well, perhaps I should say firstly, that um, it didn't quite work out after that. She she couldn't quite. He had changed, and she had changed after that terrible experience. And though they tried, it, it didn't work out. But what he did not tell her, and probably it was good that he, that he didn't tell her that, and we know that he didn't tell her because shortly before she died, she wrote her, her memoirs, and she only gave his first name and didn't say anything about this. But the reason why he was called, 
called to Europe was because of the assassination of Eugene Konovalets, Yevhen Konovalets, who was the head of the Ukrainian organization of nationalists, who was assassinated in Rotterdam in the spring of 1938. So, um, the organization wanted him to go investigate and find out who had done this and why. Um, we know now that this career of this uh, Ukrainian, this uh, French Canadian woman, who in 19, uh, 1939, when the war broke out, eventually returned to Canada, moved to Montreal, uh, became a novelist. In 1945, became a world-famous novelist with the publication of her first book. And um, we know now that this political event in Ukrainian history helped to cause her to abandon uh, a career as an actress and become um, a writer. And so Canadian literature, in a way, French Canadian literature indeed, is linked to Ukrainian history through this particular event. And this, to me, I think was a great discovery. Um, nobody had ever talked about this before. She didn't know it herself. She died without knowing it, I believe. And uh, it was known to a small circle of Ukrainians in Toronto, some of whom I met and interviewed, and, uh, even uh, were, were fairly good friends with. Um, but outside of that circle, the world as a whole didn't know. And I was able to put it together and... Uh, tell this story. So I think that's a very uh, original contribution uh, to both Canadian history, history of Canadian literature, and also to the history of the Ukrainian national movement in Europe. There's also an essay on um, Yaroslav Rodnitsky, the famous philologist uh, who established the Department of Slavic Studies at the University of Manitoba in the late 1940s. Um, he was a uh, a strange man in some ways, um, who loved uh, getting away from home and traveling. And he traveled all over the Western world. He traveled uh, throughout Europe, one end to the other. He traveled across the United States, across Canada, to Australia, to throughout the Mediterranean. And um, everywhere that he went, he visited Ukrainian archives, Ukrainian libraries, and Ukrainian intellectuals and art galleries, if wherever he could find them whether they were public or private. And he would write about them. He'd write little articles for the press back in Canada, in the Ukrainian language for Ukrainian newspapers primarily. And then when he got back to Canada, he published little books on the subject. And he published a whole series of such books. And uh, in one of my essays in this volume, I discussed that. I discussed his importance as a what's called a bibliographer, a person who uh, compiles bibliographies, lists of books, and a librarian who evaluates libraries. And uh, he was so important and so good at this sort of thing that the Library of Congress in, in the American capital, Washington, D.C., asked him to uh, survey their library and tell them about the Ukrainian holdings in the library, which he did. It was never published, in, but it's been distributed in, in a Xerox manuscript and uh, deposited in various important libraries throughout the world. Yes, there's a, um, a wide variety, actually, of uh, Ukrainian holdings in Canada. Um, and this has changed over the years. It's even changed quite a bit during my own lifetime. Um, earlier on, the, the major focus of Ukrainian uh, population in Canada was on the prairies, uh, stretching from uh, Manitoba through Saskatchewan to Alberta. And uh, people in that part of the country were collecting books already in the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, I think in particular of uh, Julian Satishin in uh, Saskatoon, a small town really. But he was a great book collector. And uh, he went to Europe in 1928 and was buying books right and left. He visited the View, visited all the bookstores there, and brought all these books back to Canada with him. There are other places, especially uh, ecclesiastical libraries, uh, where um, uh, prominent churchmen would collect books. There's one in Mundarin in Alberta, which has a large collection of religious books, and there are several in Winnipeg. Winnipeg was very, very important in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, because the uh, hierarchs of both Ukrainian churches were resident there. And uh, the Orthodox set up their college, St. Andrew's College, 
in the city, and the uh, uh, Ukrainian Catholic uh, Metropolitan as well uh, had a library and archive. So there, those are the old ones. But then in the 1960s and 19, especially the 1970s, the focus shifted somewhat from private Ukrainian libraries and uh, Prosvita libraries, the, the, the reading club libraries, which existed in various cities in Canada, shifted from there into the universities. And universities began to build up their Ukrainian collections. And um, when I started my, my work in this area, the two uh, greatest uh, university collections at Ukrainica were already the University of Toronto and the University of Alberta. In Alberta, because of the uh, Ukrainian research, the Ukrainian, uh, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies located there, and in Toronto because of the Department of Slavic Studies, uh, uh, which uh, was fairly large uh, by the 1960s, and at which a, a very prominent scholars, especially George Lutsky, who was a literary historian, uh, had his base. So those were the two major uh, uh, collections of Ukrainica in the in the 1970s and 80s when when I became involved in the field. Um, unfortunately, we're entering a new phase now, uh, which began actually with the collapse of the Soviet Union. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of public interest diminished in that part of the world, so that. Um, Students in, in, enrolled in Russian history classes and the history of Eastern Europe and that sort of thing, and even in Ukrainian history, to some degree, uh, declined. The enrollments declined somewhat. In Ukrainian history, in particular, at the University of Toronto, they didn't decline as much in certain other pl- as in certain other places, uh, but uh, there was a general decline in Slavic studies. And therefore, uh, university administrations were reluctant to put more money into those fields. So there's a certain uh, resistance to this among the professors who are still working in those departments, but the administration is always trying to cut back. At the same time, within the Ukrainian communities uh, uh, stretched across the country, there is um, a division of opinion. Some people think that they should spend their money and their resources on helping Ukraine because, for example, in these days, as I speak today, Ukraine is at war unofficially with with Russia, and its eastern provinces have been partly occupied by uh, pro-Russian forces. So um, there's a certain urgency that some people feel to help Ukraine in this emergency emergency situation. Uh, On the other hand, some of these very old libraries uh, in Canada and archives uh, are starved for cash. They don't have money to hire librarians, they don't have money to hire archivists, they don't even have money to hire administrators to, to see that things go smoothly. So those types of uh, libraries, and I think I, I would point once again to, well, I'd point to to Osteretic, the Center for the Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center in Winnipeg, a wonderful old uh, institution uh, dating back to 1944, thrived during the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, firstly on Ukrainian private funding and then with some help from multiculturalism beginning in the 80s. Uh, But today it's in a very difficult situation, uh, financially starved. And uh, it contains enormous resources. For example, some of the letters that I used to put together my essay on Gabriel Wa and Stephen Davidovich, his letters to Yevhen Konovalis in particular, I got from the Osiretic archive. They're deposited there. So it contains many treasures of that sort, and they're, they're in danger. And um, I think that um, it would be worthwhile to, to, to preserve these collections if we could. So um, if there are any philanthropists out there, please consider it. Well, this question of um, what spheres of, of study would be best funded is a, quite a complex one. Um, and it exists on several different levels. I think there is a certain amount of interest in Ukrainian politics, um, and there is uh, a desire to see the study of of contemporary Ukraine uh, succeed. Um, At the same time, in Canada, traditionally, we have had uh, very strong um, interests in Ukrainian history and in Ukrainian literature. And these are presently um, 
as I mentioned a bit earlier, there there's certain dangers uh, um, with focusing just on politics and nothing else. So in my opinion, there has to be a balance between these things. There has to be a certain amount of funding and support for uh, current Ukrainian politics and its study. And there has to be a certain amount of support for other things like Ukrainian history, Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian art, and all of these other fields, which uh, are important in their own right as well. As well, we have to have a kind of balance if we want to preserve our, our community in this country and if we want to see it thrive. We have to have balance between supporting things in Europe, supporting uh, Ukrainian culture in Europe, which some people uh, are very concerned with, and supporting Ukrainian culture here in Canada and our institutions in Canada, because I mean, as I mentioned above, um, some of them are in danger, and the danger is right now is very acute. So um, I think there has to be a balance, and um, that's what I would like to see. Oh, yes, uh, there's quite a, quite a n- number of differences uh, firstly, the histories of the two communities are, although in some ways they're parallel, in other ways they're quite different. For example, in the United, in Canada here, uh, the Ukrainians were a major uh, demographic group uh, for many, many years. They were the fourth largest demographic group in the country after the British groups, the French and the Germans for most of the 20th century. And they were over, only overtaken by other groups like the Italians in the 1970s, the Chinese in the 2001 census, and the most recent census, uh, I think it's the 2006 census, by Native Canadian Indians. Now they've slipped to about 10th. But for most of the, the uh, 20th century, they were the fourth largest group in the country. And when it came to uh, the crisis of the 1960s, when uh, Canada was in danger of splitting up into a, uh, an independent Quebec and the rest, um, the federal government, uh, who, which was reluctant to turn to the German community as representatives of Canadian ethnics because of the, the two wars, especially the Second World War, which had just ended, they turned to the next largest group, which, which was the Ukrainian group, and appointed Yaroslav Rudnitsky to the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. And partly out of that royal commission came the whole idea of multiculturalism and a multicultural Canada. So this is very important in Canadian history. And most uh, Ukrainian-Canadian scholars and intellectuals are aware of this. On the other hand, in the United States, the Ukrainians were always a relatively small group. They didn't have such a high profile in Canada. They didn't have the political influence in Canada. In the United States, the largest Slavonic group was not the Ukrainians, like in Canada, but rather the Poles, of which I think there were about 9.5 million by the year 2000. So 9.5, or or something like that, 9.5 million. Anyhow, they were by far the largest Slavonic group. And just as the Ukrainians in Canada led the charge uh, to uh, balance things out, for example, to um, fight against Soviet propaganda, denigrating such groups, so the Poles in the United States took on that, that role. So in some ways, it's not quite correct to compare Ukrainian Canadians with the Ukrainian Americans. Rather, the comparison should be Ukrainian Canadians and Polish Americans, because the Poles were the biggest Slavonic group there, just as we were the biggest Slavonic group here. So that's on the demographic level. With regard to scholarship, again, there's a huge difference. In the United States, the emphasis was always on Ukraine. There's very little study of the Ukrainian Americans, a handful of books, nothing more than that. Whereas in Canada, we had a real flourishing of scholarship on Ukrainian-Canadian institutions and culture throughout the 1970s and 1980s. And this goes back even further, right back to the 1950s. And it continues even today with the work of outstanding scholars like Oris Martinovich uh, in Western Canada. So, yes, there's differences on both levels. The important thing to remember is that the entire book uh, describes uh, a search, a search for this heritage that was partly lost and uh, had to be rediscovered. And that's the theme of the book. And the conclusions are that there, uh, there is a rich heritage there. There's an interesting story there that needs to be told, and I tried to tell as much of it as I could in this particular book.
And thank you very much, William. I've seen you a lot of a lot of uh, uh, lectures, of course, and uh, everybody is very appreciative of your work. So thank you very much from from myself and from all the others as well.